Struggle. Strife. A complete disregard for the laws of physics. Breath of the Wild without jumping or gliding may have been the toughest challenge I have ever tried. And now, here I am. Prepping to try the same challenge on its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom. But hey, surely it can't get more trying than Breath of the Wild was. What could they possibly throw at us that could hold a candle to the Divine Beasts? Sky Islands, huh? Then so be it. Is it possible to beat The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom without jumping or gliding? So, what exactly are our rules and goals for this challenge? On the rules side of things, we cannot jump or glide. In fact, I'm banning all uses of the jump button, X, during gameplay, which prevents us from doing the following things. Uh, jumping, gliding, backflips, side hops, dodging, flurry rushes, leaping while climbing, this hop you can do while sneaking, launching off a horse, and dashing while swimming? Additionally, we are not allowed to let the glider be used at all, regardless of what button makes it happen. So just as an example, swimming up a waterfall automatically causes us to glide, so therefore, we can't do that. Now as for what we are trying to do, our goals. Obviously, we want to beat Ganondorf and see the credits roll. But I say that's not enough. I want to have a fulsome Tears of the Kingdom experience, so before we fight the Demon King, we'll have to do the following. Complete all six major dungeons, find all the memories, and activate all of the Skyview Towers. If we can do all that without jumping, then that's what we around here call a success. So let's get into it. The opening goes rather smoothly. I just walk and slash, no jumping even remotely near being necessary. That being said, I do utterly fail in fighting against Ganondorf. No, I should have brought a shield, but on the bright side, I am saved from having to paraglide by this arm, so... Yay! In any case, after suffering such humiliation, welcome to NOT the Shrine of Resurrection. Our first obstacles are these little diving platforms, which explicitly tell you to jump off of them. Luckily, you can just run off and all you'll miss are some style points. We do learn, though, that, and I quote, landing in water, even from a great height, will prevent you from taking fall damage. That'll probably be useful later. Like right now. Welcome to the Great Plat- uh, uh, this Great Sky Island. Here we meet some constructs, cool little robots constructed by the Zonai, though not nearly as cool as the robots from my card game, but whatever. It's with these guys that we enter our first combat, which at least so far is going alright in spite of the Master Sword's current state. We approach the Temple of Time, where Raru directs us to visit, wait for it, four shrines. Well, technically he's only asked us to go to three, but we all know where this is going. First stop, the Akau Shrine. Here is where we learn how to use the Ultra Hand. The first few obstacles here are cleared easily, but this last one with the hook and rail doesn't quite go so smoothly. You see, the build I normally go for for this puzzle leaves the platform hanging on the hook too high to reach without jumping. But fear not, for if you angle the hook like so, you can manage to step on just in the nick of time. Shrine number one, cleared. Getting to and beating Shrine two is even easier. The journey to get to Shrine three is a bit more involved, culminating in having to find a way up this icy cliff face. My first instinct is to put some logs together and climb up. Unfortunately, without the ability to jump, Link seems content to instead just fruitlessly push away at the logs. Guess we'll have to find another way. Luckily, tucked away behind the waterfall, I'm able to find this strip of cliff face free from ice. 
I climb up, and now it's time to face the Gutenbach Shrine. No problems here. We ride a wing back to the Temple of Time, only to find that we, in fact, need to tackle one more shrine. Luckily, the Nachia Shrine is super easy to get to, and as for getting through it, we do have a bit of a problem when it comes to stepping off the rafts without jumping. Fortunately, a bit of Ultra Hand, used in conjunction with Rewind, allows us to move the rafts to a higher point, which we can then get off from fairly easily. And that's the Great Sky Island cleared. We send the Master Sword back in time and dive off into the water of the world below. Now that we're back on the surface, it makes sense to go to look at landing first. But on the way, let's take care of the Tajikat Shrine, register a horse, Mercury II, tackle the Yamiyo Shrine, and investigate the Kiyonana Shrine. Unfortunately, this one is the combat tutorial, which means dodging is required to get through it. So we can't do it. Good thing it's optional. Now as for Lookout Landing, apparently they're off searching for Zelda and want me to help. I mean, I guess I'll put it on the old to-do list, but only after conquering the Geosyn Shrine. This is a shrine I just sort of despise normally, but we also, in this case, have the added wrinkle of needing to use some rewind to be able to reach the end of it. Let's also take on the Susiya Shrine and the Ishodag Shrine. Now, at first glance, this opening might look impossible, as the typical way to handle it is to use the provided fan to create an updraft to use with your paraglider. We obviously can't do that. What we can do instead, and remember this tactic because this will be far from the last time we use it, is use Ultra Hand to move the fan up to the height we need to reach, then stand on the fan and rewind it. The rest of the shrine is basically normal. We make our way over to the new Serene Stable and the Sinakawak Shrine, where Impa gives us a lift in her balloon to investigate this geoglyph. Um, the only problem being that we don't have a way down once we're up here. At the very least, there doesn't seem to be any water close enough to land in, and I'm not really wanting to die? I try using a fan to steer the balloon somewhere where I might be able to land safely, but that didn't exactly work. Ah. Well, through the power of fading to black, we somehow survived that. Anyway, it's memory time. And you know what? After all that excitement, maybe it is about time we head to Hyrule Castle and help out the kind folks at Lookout Landing. Alright, UFZ discovered, and now Pura wants me to help her activate the Skyview Towers. Doing so would even get me a paraglider. Of course... I don't really want a paraglider. That being said, we will have to do this if we want to be able to fulfill our goal of activating all of the towers. But even so, there's something I need to take care of first. Trust me on this. And don't you worry, Pura. Just hold tight standing there and I'll be back to help out with the tower in... several days. Probably. One thing I'd like to do before helping out Pura is buy myself a new set of armor. Unfortunately, even the renowned hero of Hyrule has to pay for such things, and I'm basically broke. But not to worry, I've got a plan for that, and not even an inexplicable century-long gap in my resume is going to stop me. Let's head north. Along the way, we encounter the Runakit Shrine, which is a bit troublesome given how navigating through it is premised on the use of a paraglider. So no dice then? Not quite. Yes, there's no means by which we can progress on this starting platform, but there is on that one which we can reach by carefully bouncing across the rail. From here, we can send supplies down the rail, which we can then use to cross this gap, and from there, the shrine plays like normal. We also encounter the Qyoyu Shrine, which, uh, yeah, nope, 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 moving on. The Aura Chium Shrine is next, and honestly pretty easy. And you know what? While we're in the area, why not grab a memory? And finally we arrive at the Lucky Clover Gazette to secure our new job. What? I like the Gazette missions, okay? Let me have this. Now, since we're here in Tabantha and all, we could see about helping out the... Ritos. <laughs> you know what? Uh, maybe not today. Or, or ever. Let's not go up anywhere else. And on the way, I suppose we can grab another memory, another horse, and enter the Forgotten Temple to, uh, not take a picture of all the memory locations, because, uh, I've done so little at Lookout Landing that I don't have a camera yet. 
Great planning on my part. Oh, we also take care of the Maya Shrine. Anyway, now that I'm gainfully employed, it's time to set course for the true reason we've left Pearl hanging, a reason which dwells in Zora's domain. On the way, we uncover another memory, breeze through the Janasau Shrine, and trudge through loads of sludge. We also encounter a decent amount of combat, which makes now uh, as good a time as any to talk a bit about the combat. The no jumping and gliding challenge affects Tears of the Kingdom's moment to moment gameplay significantly. One such example of this is the combat. Just like in Breath of the Wild, Link's arguably most useful skill in combat is dodging. It's a great way to avoid taking a hit that normally doesn't require super precise inputs to achieve. Though if you are precise, then you can be rewarded with a perfect dodge and the opportunity to flurry rush. When playing this game normally, I am all about dodges and flurry rushes. Of course, in this challenge, we uh, can't do that at all. This affects what sort of weapons are most effective for us. The obvious implication being that shields are king. The ability to just face an enemy and passively block most of their attacks is nigh necessary in this challenge. Therefore, one-handed weapons are particularly great as they pair with shields most effectively. But that's not to say the other weapon types are worthless. You can also use shields with two-handed weapons or pole arms. You just have to make sure you put your weapon away when the enemy is about to strike. But even considering that, I still really don't like two-handed weapons. Yes, they generally have good damage, knockback, and stun potential, but getting those first couple of strikes in can be tough due to how long it takes to swing one of them. Personally, I prefer pole arms. No, you're not going to be stunlocking your opponents into their graves, but the attack speed is so much faster, and the range is quite helpful. There's also, of course, bows, which are nice and can help you take down enemies without putting yourself in danger at all. Though, they don't do that much damage, especially if you're not hitting headshots. But that's enough about combat. Let's talk about Zora's Domain. I speak to Yona about the state of the realm before enduring the strenuous climb to the top of Palmas Mountain, in part to meet with Prince Sidon, but mostly to go fishing. Oh, and easily beat the Ihena Shrine. Ancient Arowana in hand, I get Yona to repair my Zora armor. This armor allows Link to swim up waterfalls. Something that'll be quite important in the near future, since that's how you would normally get to the Water Temple. Uh, th there is one wrinkle, though. Swimming up a waterfall automatically causes us to glide, so therefore, we can't do that. Yeah, I guess I did say that, didn't I? I guess that probably means we'll need to come up with a whole other way to get to the Water Temple. Which is not going to be fun, given how high in the sky it is. But, we don't even currently own a paraglider right now. So surely if we don't have a paraglider in the first place, we can't activate the paraglider we don't have by swimming up waterfalls, right? <laughs> Indeed, the lack of a paraglider does stop waterfalls from activating one, which, you know, makes sense. Granted, landing is a bit more difficult since we're stuck with skydiving controls, but it is possible. Now to actually clear the way to the water temple. But first, let's take on the Magawak Shrine, which is about as easy as normal. We visit the king and then have to get to this sky island. Luckily, the required materials to make a hot air balloon are right here. So onwards, Link. Onto the island we go. We meet up with Sidon, defeat the sludge-like, then venture down into the ancient Zora waterworks. Climbing around in here can prove difficult in light of the dripping water, but recall helps with that significantly. In no time, we're swimming up to approach the water temple. Navigating the water bubbles is a lot more clumsy than usual. Instead of riding them up, then gliding to the islands from whence they came, we're left relying on Ultra Hand and Recall to cross these gaps. The next major obstacles are these waterfalls, which you'd normally glide between, but I've got a better idea. Let's just build a plane and skip the whole thing entirely. There we go. Problem solved. And while we're in the area, the Igashon Shrine seems nice. And yeah, it is. Next obstacle, even more waterfalls smattered about the sky. Good thing I've got a lot of Zonai devices to build planes with. That being said, making the transfer from a moving plane to swimming up a waterfall is not exactly hard to mess up, but it can be done. Uh, then after some combat, we've got to work out a glide-free way to cross this gap. Easy, just build a ramp, then hitch a ride on a bubble utilizing said ramp. And finally, one last plane and some waterfall swimming brings us into the water temple proper. 
Alright, to beat the temple, we've got to activate four switches scattered around here. Let's get on that. The firewall can be solved like most problems in life, by using a plane. Once inside, the fact that the walls are climbable proves quite useful. And there we go. Switch one, activated. The low gravity actually makes traveling around to get to the other switches a lot easier than you'd expect. That's of course not to say I never had to bring out Ultrahand plus Rewind, but that's just the standard tool in the toolbox at this point. Once we get to the island to toast it on, the second switch is pretty easy. After some bubble shenanigans, I reach the next switch and activate it. And finally, Ascend helps out with the last one. Mukturok is a bit annoying, but never life-threatening, and there we go. The Water Temple has been beaten, and now I get a cool Sidon avatar to follow me around. Great. Next stop, look at landing. I've probably kept Pur waiting long enough. Although, we could make a slight diversion to attain a village along the way. They do have the Zanmik Shrine there, which is extraordinarily easy. And a stop by Kakariko seems sensible enough, though the Makasura Shrine seems like more trouble than it's worth. Okay, fine. I'll, I'll go. I'll go to look at landing, get the paraglider, and activate the Skyview Tower. There. Happy? Granted, now that we're up here... What exactly is the plan to not die? Well, I do seem to recall that water is supposed to break your fall fairly effectively, so into the moat we go. All right, works like a charm. Surely such bodies of water will abound anywhere else the tower is located, right? I finally buy some proper Hylian armor, and now it's time to set forth for the Gerudo Desert. On the way, we invest in the power of music to help a local band play for a couple of great fairies. And we, of course, try to activate the Skyview Towers we come across. Unfortunately, as it turns out, they're not all conveniently right next to bodies of water. And even when they are, like in the case of this one, it doesn't necessarily help. I seem to remember being assured that landing in water, even from a great height, will prevent you from taking damage. Oh well, I guess this water missed the memo. Luckily, in this instance, there is a nearby well, which after... Several attempts. I do manage to land in from the tower, thus saving my life. I go on to build a lovely little all-terrain vehicle to explore around Lake Hylia and experience another memory. I also explore around the Great Plateau, including taking on the Kyokugan Shrine and fighting my way to activate the Hyrule Field Skyview Tower. Luckily, there's plenty of water around to break this fall. The Maya Chin Shrine is kind of annoying, but no more so than usual. Then there's the Su Su Shrine, which I overcome in probably the cheapest way imaginable. But it worked! Now don't worry too much about the meandering, because the path to the Gerudo Desert continues by boat, and by cave, and by climb, and by slide. We even activate the Gerudo Canyon Skyview Tower along the way. And after all that, finally... The desert lies before us. Within said desert is the Mayatat Shrine, which is really easy. We take a little break at Karkara Bazaar to relax and cook, and then it's off into the Sand Shroud, which is a bit less navigable than usual since we can't use the updrafts in it to get a bird's eye view of the situation at hand. We encounter some Gibdos on the way, which luckily some elementally tipped arrows do a good job at dispatching. I'd been meaning to find Gerudo Town, but ended up at this ruin instead. <laughs> Just the right place to find who I was looking for anyway. Ah! Chief Riju. Together we militarily crush the Gibdos at Kar Kar Bazaar and then at Garuda Town itself. Then it's off into the desert again to uncover the Lightning Temple. Come on, Riju, let's do the- Oh, oh my. After killing that massive thing. Okay. Now that we've uh, scared the bug off, uh, now let's do this. The beginning of our expedition is mostly linear and combat based. No real need to jump. Finally, we reach the Room of Ascension, where gliding becomes a much greater temptation. Well, let's see if we can activate all four switches regardless. The first one's ridiculously easy, so hopefully that's a good sign going forward. Gaining access to the chamber where the second one is located is helped by the fact that, unlike in the Divine Beasts, Link can climb temples in this game. Switch 2 activated. 
Unlocking another door can be done by holding a mirror out in the middle of the room, like so. Then within, gaining access to the third switch can be done with a hot air balloon and a mirror. Now come to think of it, a hot air balloon would be super useful in the central chamber. So yeah, let's just move it in there, and there we go. Welcome to the top floor. Now we just redirect some light and ride the balloon again before being faced with a deep shaft downwards filled with fire. Obviously jumping down it wouldn't be wise, but climbing down, now that I can get behind. And there we go, the fourth switch has been activated, which means it's boss time. And yeah, lacking the ability to jump doesn't really change this fight, so there we go. Another temple is beaten, and Riju gives me her aid, which will be much more useful than Sidon's, as her ability basically allows us to make our arrows electrify things, set things on fire, and or blow things up as needed. Not to mention just the uh, sheer damage increase our arrows will now have, along with being AoE weapons. So yeah, thanks Riju. You'll be an invaluable part of our party going forward, I'm sure. While we're so near to Gruder Town, let's grab this memory and activate the Highlands Tower. Unfortunately, this time around, there's no water close enough to land in. So what's our alternative to dying, then? It's actually simpler than you might think. Teleportation. So yeah, that actually works. I kind of expected it wouldn't, but it does, so... I guess landing after activating a Skyview Tower is just flat out not a problem anymore. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to play for another Great Fairy, but first let's take on the Utsu Shock Shrine, which plays about normally. Then after a bit of entomology, we meet the fairy and get some more armor upgrades. Lovely. Now, you may think that the logical next stop on our adventure is another temple. However, it really is about time that we visit the depths, as doing so is necessary to get auto build, which I imagine will be quite useful in the next few temples. There's just one problem. Without the use of a paraglider, plunging into the depths generally results in death. So what's the plan? Well, the fact that I'm at Kakariko's Chasm, specifically, is important. Now I've just gotta wait. Alright, it's go time. So here's the deal. The dragons and tears of the kingdom travel between the sky and the depths specifically by flying down through the world's chasms. Nadra happens to, on occasion, fly down through the Kakariko Chasm. We can take advantage of this by ultra-handing and recalling a hoverstone out over the chasm. Then we run off it and cling to the dragon for dear life. And just like that, welcome to the depths. Sort of. There's still the slight problem that the dragons fly pretty high up in the depths. So if we were to just run off Nadra, we'd probably die still. But there's nothing a little bit of ingenuity can't fix, and by a bit of ingenuity, I of course mean another plane. It's, it's another plane. So, we've made it to the depths. Now what? Simple, we've just got to get to the central mind where we can claim auto build. Easier said than done. And here's why. In Tears of the Kingdom, the depths, topographically speaking, are an inversion of the overworld. So, for example, say there's a mountain up in Hyrule. Directly beneath said mountain in the depths will be a valley, and vice versa. Why does this matter? Well, naturally, that means the absolute lowest points in Hyrule will be the absolute highest points in the depths. Up in Hyrule, bodies of water, places where the ground technically drops below sea level, that's as low as you get, which corresponds to the depths' maximum height. Completely impassable walls that stretch all the way to the ceiling. Take a look at this map. We are here, near Kakariko, and the central mine is under the Great Plateau. Doesn't seem like a terrible journey until you account for the fact that every body of water on this map is an impassable wall, which turns a relatively straightforward route into this meandering mess, all navigated in the annoyingly dark depths, mind you. Now, if I were playing normally, I'd just find a chasm closer to the destination and go from there. Uh, but there aren't exactly a ton of chasms that dragons fly into. And that means we're basically stuck venturing forth from the Kakariko Chasm. <sighs> well, here we go.
Well, that took a while. Anyway, now that we're at the central mine, we finally acquire Autobuild and team up with Riju to humble Master Koga. While we're in the area, we take the time to go help out Robbie, and then it's time to turn back towards the surface. It's far easier to get to Goron City than it has been to get to any of the other major settlements we've visited thus far. That doesn't mean we didn't have some fun along the way, though. Iko Chiyo Shrine was alright, though I can't help but feel a bit miffed at how many of these shrines can have their unique puzzles, completely subverted with a very simple application of Ultra Handed Rewind. I mean, I guess I shouldn't complain about something good for me, but still. No problems at Timowak Shrine either. The Elden Canyon Tower, though, uh, that's a different story. The basic issue is as follows. The doors don't work, making the only way inside entering through a hole in the roof. Now, getting to said hole isn't really a problem, it just requires a bit of climbing. What is a problem is surviving a drop down the hole. It's a very long and thin shaft, meaning that a lot of our Zonai devices don't even fit through it. One that does is a mirror. Now that doesn't really help much, because if you arrange the mirror over the hole and then ride it down, it actually falls faster than you, and then you still just hit the ground dead anyway. But, if as you descend, you regularly use your rewind on it, not to actually rewind it, but more so just to use it like stasis, that can stop Link from separating from the mirror, thus enabling a safe landing. So in summary, Skyview Tower conquered. Next up is a memory, followed by the Kasanana Shrine, which obviously doesn't require jumping. Then there are a couple more misadventures to do with treasure and naked men, but hey, we do make it to Goron City, and meet its local mob boss, Yenobo? Well, okay, look, don't worry about Yenobo being involved in organized crime, it's honestly taken care of pretty quickly. And then we take on the Marakugar Shrine. Sitsum Shrine is pretty easy once you build effectively a step stool to get onto your vehicles. And then it's plain time to take down Miragia. After that's done, you just have to go down through the chasm in Death Mountain without dying. Unfortunately, lava isn't really the liquid you need to break your fall in such a circumstance. No matter. We'll just use the same method we used back at the Elden Tower to get down this chasm. Okay, fine idea, until you take into account all of the obstacles on the way down, which such a method gives you no means to avoid. Yeah, and most vehicles I can come up with aren't exactly resilient enough to survive the descent with me still riding them. Okay, I guess we'll need to go back to the drawing board on this one. Uh, let's take a quick break to activate the Ulri Mountain Skyview Tower. And now that we've done that, let's look around in some wells for a resource that might help us. After a bit of searching in the outskirts stable well, I find what I'm looking for. A fairy. Fairies, of course, bring you back from death. This includes falling deaths. And just like that, we are in the depths below Death Mountain, and are ready to take on the fire tower. This time, there's five switches to find. And honestly, by and large, the challenge in this dungeon mostly just forces us to play it properly. You know, actually working out all the puzzles instead of just gliding everywhere. In fact, it actually made the dungeon way more fun. <laughs> Honestly, if you haven't played Tears of the King of the Out or want to replay it, I would highly recommend doing the No Jump or Glide Challenge specifically for this dungeon, even if you're planning on playing the rest of the game normally. Though I will say, this last one was slightly unintuitive to figure out, and then the boss fight is mostly normal, leaving us free to head for... Rito Village. Very few can achieve a mastery of the sky. Maybe we should just settle this one on one. How about up there? Oh, you must pardon me. I forgot you have no way of making it up to that divine beast on your own. Uh, actually, you know what? I was thinking about it, and maybe, maybe, hear me out on this, perhaps we should. Find the Master Sword first! Yeah, let's do that. that. That sounds way better. In order to obtain the sword, I think we're going to need to do some more shrines first. So let's get on that. My Chidic Shrine annoys me, but not due to a lack of jumping. Jochiyu Shrine is incredibly easy, as is Rasatakwa Shrine and Maya Hisik Shrine. Another easy thing is activating the Rebella Wetlands Tower. Back to shrines, Sifimum Shrine is a lovely time, especially if you mess with the boats. 
This memory, uh, less lovely. Now we go back into the depths to try to get underneath the Lost Woods. Unfortunately, there are massive walls in the way. But, not if we try going from underneath Death Mountain. Not that it's a pleasant journey, but it is technically possible, and that's all I need. We ascend to Korok Forest and take on the Musano Kerr Shrine before diving into the Deku Tree Chasm. Now, you might be wondering how I intend to survive such a fall. The answer is simple. Because as it turns out, Link has the strongest grip known to man. I'm serious, this boy can fall thousands of feet, but so long as he lands by grabbing a sheer cliff with his hands instead of by landing on his feet, he will survive and usually take no damage whatsoever. Now the real issue here is dealing with these gloom heads. The way I go about it is by positioning myself on this ledge to then position myself on a floating platform to rain bomb arrows upon my enemies. And then when I run out of those, uh, I guess some good old fashioned hand-to-hand -hand combat can work well enough to uh, finish them off. Once that's done, I can breathe a sigh of relief when Phantom Ganon shows up. Seriously, surely that wasn't intentional. I, tears looking at was weird. And just like that, the Deku Tree is cured and I am rewarded with a tracker on the Master Sword. Now just teleport near to the spot indicated on my map, scale a nearby mountain, assemble a lovely hot air balloon, and fly up to the light dragon. Boarding her goes well enough. Now I just need to cautiously make my way to the head where thanks to my stamina, I can pull the sword and be urged on in my mission by Princess Zelda. Okay, we've got the master sword. <sighs> I know it must be done. It's time to head to read over. On the way, we activate the Lindor's Brow Skyview Tower, conquer the Makara Kiss Shrine, recall a memory, and save a musician. Now, the first thing we've got to work out is how we're going to get to Rito Village in light of the downed bridge. Why, by making our own bridge, of course. Uh, let's just hope Osha isn't around to sue me, but this works for now. And, almost as soon as I arrive, Ton flies out into the Hepper Mountains. Great. Guess I've got to follow the kid now. Uh, stupid Rito just taking off when we're over the link with their stupid wings. Along the way, we activate the Rospero Pass Tower. Now, back to climbing. We catch up to Tolan, and then, lo and behold, even more climbing to get to the epicenter of the blizzard. And this next part is what we got Autobuild for. For our next challenge involves going from floating platform a floating platform and later airship to airship, which would normally serve to highlight the extent to which Tolan helps your gliding. For us though, it'll be a test of how effectively we can use various flying machines. Hopefully, we can make it to the temple before we run out of Zonite devices and or Zonite.
Finally, we make it to the Wind Temple. Hopefully activating these five switches won't be as much of a pain as getting here was. Switch one, easy. The bit of climbing gets me into the interior of the ship where switch two awaits. Next, we enter through a different entrance and manipulate some icicles to get to switch number three. To get to the fourth switch, we've got to get to the top of this part of the ship. Unfortunately, all the ice makes it unclimbable. I try using a rocket shield instead, but as it turns out, rocket shields make you glide, so... So much for that idea. Maybe a more conventional flying machine will do the trick. Though I am running very low on Zonite devices and Zonite, so... We might have to get creative. Like with a hot air plane. Now, I don't really have the batter to fly it properly, but a bit of rewind helps with that. Not enough, apparently. Fine. I'll do a rocket plane then. And there we go. From here, we just climb to get to switch number four. Now all that's left is to reach the very bottom of the ship for the fifth switch. It's pretty annoying, but with skilled enough piloting, a simple wing and control stick gets you there. That means it's boss time. But yeah, uh, Colgera doesn't look like it'll be a pushover. Especially since we start the fight falling to our death. It'll certainly be difficult to get all our shots off in a single descent. But maybe we don't have to. Because here's the deal. If we die, then the respawn point is on this platform way high up and, importantly, on solid ground. From this vantage point, it's not all too difficult to bring Colgara down to half health. Unfortunately, reaching the halfway mark sends us plunging down to our death. Again. And now death is no longer a valid strategy since that'll reset the fight back to the start of phase one. Our best alternative is falling down past the ship, which doesn't kill us. Instead, place gets on the deck of the ship after losing, like, a heart. Okay, so we're alive. Yay! But there's no way we'll be able to land the shots we need from all the way down here. And without gliding, we don't have a way to get back up. Or do we? Yes, from here we can't win. But if we die again and redo the first half of the fight and get back to the point where we're falling. Now, instead of falling to the abyss, perhaps we'd be better served landing on a bouncy sail. It takes patience, but yes, the bouncing does yield the necessary height, allowing us to take down Kulgar. And in doing so, beats the Wind Temple without jumping or gliding. Now that all four major dungeons have been taken care of, it's time to head back to Lookout Landing and report our findings to Pura. And well, don't we have good timing? Turns out Zelda has been spotted at Hyrule Castle. Let's go get her. Now, you might think that getting up to a floating castle would be difficult without jumping or gliding. But it's really nothing a bit of amateur rocketry can't fix. Though one thing to keep in mind while engaging in rocketry is that if you want success, always minimize the weight of your payload. And now we go on a wild goose chase around the castle for Princess Zelda while fighting a lot of monsters along the way. No particular need to jump, though. We finally make our way to the Sanctum, where we find out... Oh no! This Zelda is evil! Who could have possibly guessed? We then proceed to fight loads of Phantom Ganons. They're no pushover on account of their strikes being so powerful that they routinely break our guard. But the solution to that is just intelligent spacing and sidestepping and stuff. Long story short, we beat them all with the help of our friends. I even get a new shirt out of the whole ordeal, along with a few other effects hanging around the castle. Anyway, apparently there is a fifth sage somewhere in Hyrule that we've got to find. But before that, it's time we activate the last of the Skyview Towers. The Mount Lanayru Tower was icy, but our approach to climbing icy cliffs back all the way on the Great Sky Island works like a charm here too. The Sa'asra Slopes Tower is extremely easy to find, fix, and activate. There's no issue whatsoever with activating the Upland Zorana Tower. Getting to the Typhlo Ruins Tower took a bit of ingenuity due to this emote of mud, but once you've crossed, the tower is yours after you climb to the top of it, which is also pretty easy. On my way to the Piketa Stone Grove Tower, I helped the Stable Trotters out one last time. Then the tower itself is no problem. And that is the last tower.
that is one of our four major objectives complete. Now we scour the eastern coastline for the last couple memories, and do a bit of dragon hunting while we're there. I've come up with a particularly ingenious technique. Gotta love this man's grip strength. Anyway, we've now discovered all the memories, so that's two out of three goals finished now. I guess now it's time to find the last stage. I wonder if they might, I don't know, have anything to do with that massive storm over Faron? Activating these lightning rods to dispel the storm is easy. Of course, now we've actually got to get onto the skylines, which we've just revealed, which typically isn't our strong suit to say the least. I try rewinding these rocks up, but they don't get all the way to where we need to go. I suppose I could just use one of those hover bikes we used back for the wind temple. The only issue is we don't have nearly a large enough power bank to scale that high, nor do we have enough charges in our inventory to make the journey. But that's not to say I don't have a plan. Here's what we do. We transport by horse a small wooden platform, then we attach that platform to a balloon, a fire shooter, and a rock. Now we rewind the rock back up to its highest point. Now, we detach the hot air balloon from the rock, which, thanks to the boost, can now get us all the way up to the Thunderhead Isles. And we even managed to recover the balloon. This is perfect, as outfitting the balloon with a fan makes it perfect for local transportation around the isles. Finally, we use a wing to land on Dragonhead Island, and a full-on plane to deliver the Construct Head into the depths. This brings us to the Construct Factory. A dungeon built around building various vehicles to transport the construct parts to the central hub. Building vehicles has never really been a problem for us in this challenge, so we really don't have much to worry about here. One thing that isn't great is the fact that once we have the construct assembled, we find out that in order to attach items to it, you know, its main gimmick, you have to press X, which is the jump button. No matter, I'll just take the journey on foot. I don't even like piloting mechs anyway. That goes fine, until we reach the Spirit Temple, where you have to attach a rocket to the mech to get it up a cliff. I do try climbing the cliff myself to see if the mech just warps up. It doesn't. So, after everything we've been through, is this really it? Are we really going to be forced to press the jump button over this? If it was an actual jump or glide, I could at least respect it, but to be done in by attaching something to my mech? It's just insulting! Though maybe there is one thing I could try. Here we go. I assemble a rocket plane, then pilot my mech onto it. Hit the rockets, and... Yes! Okay, no technical jumps here. All that's left for this stage is a boss fight. Now, the malice coating the floor does basically force us to use the mech, which isn't great due to the whole no attachments thing. But blocking isn't attachment based, so surviving isn't too hard. Additionally, even an unmodified punch has decent knockback which is all you need to slam your opponent into the ropes, which is the real way to deal damage in this fight anyway. And that is all dungeons cleared. That means the time has come to destroy Ganondorf. First, we've got to find a way to the bottom of the Hyrule Castle Chasm safely. I still can hardly believe this is something that actually works, but this is where Link's amazing grip strength comes in yet again. Because if you cling to a sheer cliff face as your method of landing after hitting terminal velocity, obviously you take no damage. It just makes sense. Next up is a gauntlet of enemies, some of which test my combat prowess, others I just kind of quickly run away from. Hey, it's nothing personal, I simply don't have the bombs to deal with gloom hands right now. Soon we're walking past the same sights we saw in the prologue. We climb down into the imprisoning chamber and soon find this drop. Now, there's not really much to cling onto at the bottom here, so instead, let's build a cold air balloon. And now, 
it's war. As usual, combat against normal enemies isn't all that interesting to go over. Yes, we use our shield a lot, no, we don't dodge or flurry rush, but with the help of our friends, we get by. The other bosses show up, but my friends are more than capable of handling them, and so now it's up to me to fight the Demon King. Ganondorf, I'm here. It would have been more satisfying to overcome a worthy foe. Don't worry, I think you will be satisfied. Ganondorf is probably the most capable combatant we've faced. His strikes often break my guard, and when I counterattack, he's very quick to retaliate with his own strikes. Often, instead of blocking a sidestep, is the better. What? Not even I'm allowed to do that! Who gave him permission? The perfect dodges like that so frequently, it's difficult to get a hit in at all. But, perhaps I do have a counter. There is something that I haven't used much in Tears of the Kingdom, in spite of how crucial it was in Breath of the Wild just hasn't been an enemy which demanded it. Until now! That's right, Ganondorf. You may have your perfect dodges, but I have perfect parents. Good luck. Oh, so you're angry now, are you? Let's go, Demon King, show me what you've got. Clones, that's what he's got. Have I mentioned that shields work best in single combat as opposed to uh, gang up situations? Luckily, I've got friends to lighten the load. Patience has been and still is key in this fight. You can't get greedy when you attack since you have to get your guard up before he counterattacks. It's one on one again, and now magic is playing a major role in this fight. Now sometimes the best move is to drop your guard entirely and just run. The fight has gotten frantic, but I can keep pace, and after the truest test of combat prowess in the whole game, Link is proved the better swordsman. So Ganondorf changes the parameters of our fight entirely. It's now man versus dragon in the sky. Luckily, I have my own dragon. All I've got to do is dive down, shoot his weak points, get caught by the light dragon, and repeat. There's just one problem. I don't have enough arrows. So now what? If I land on the dragon after such a long fall, I'll surely die. But I'm out of ways to damage him without landing. <sighs> Time to go out in a blaze of glory, I guess. I am going to have to farm so many arrows before trying this again. Oh. Landing on dragons doesn't cause fall damage? Well, this fight's easy, then. With dragon, Ganon bested, there's just one thing left to do. Save Zelda. Though, these circumstances aren't great. She's falling through the sky. Even if I reach her, I can't paraglide to slow her down. Luckily, this lake does the job for us. We've destroyed Ganondorf. We found Zelda. The credits roll, and we can finally say that yes, it is possible to beat The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom, without jumping or gliding. I'll be honest. I was deeply concerned when I first saw the Skylands featured in the trailers for Tears of the Kingdom. I knew I'd have to do this challenge, and it didn't seem like a welcoming environment. And it's true that in general the Sky Island sections were the hardest parts of this challenge. But luckily, Ultra Hand and Rewind especially were powerful tools to solve such problems in creative ways. As well as, of course, the building mechanics. And that's one of the magical things about Tears of the Kingdom in general. Every obstacle you come across has so many fun, inventive ways to surmount it, making this one of the most constantly engaging and fulfilling challenges I've attempted. Would highly recommend. Now for the end of the video formalities. If you enjoyed this journey we went on today, firstly, like the video. I mean, come on. If you made it this far, you clearly did like it. So just press that button. Though you may also want to check out my no jumping or gliding challenge for Breath of the Wild. If you like this video, that one's pretty special. Trust me. Additionally, if you want to support the channel, please leave a comment, subscribe, or even join my Patreon like these fine individuals on screen. They got to see this video 24 hours early, and we'll get to see some bonus content, like the full fight against Ganondorf uncut. I'd especially like to thank my $15 tier patron, Ashvin Says. But anyways guys, until next time, I have been Simcraft, rushing to get the next video out for you all to enjoy. Goodbye.